So, welcome to part two of um, my sundial talk. Um, the starting point today is resolving uh, an open question from last time, uh, which hopefully shouldn't take too long. Uh, and then we can, and then we're kind of done with the, um, the algebra, uh, if you like, and uh, we can gaze at some, um, you know, the fruits of our labors in terms of um, plots of uh, shadow um, tip paths. Uh, in other words, um, analema. Analemas. I'm not sure how you pluralize that. I'm not even sure how to pronounce it. I guess I always thought it was analemma, but I have no idea now that you say it out loud. Yeah. Well, I don't even know what correct means. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. Evolved and we're just, you know, we have certain accents and pronunciations. I don't know where the word comes from. But I could see how you might focus on the lemma part of mm, the analemma mm, mm. Um, word. Okay. So um, looking at the first board, we've got the final kind of diagram. And I might just do a, a, a bit of a recap um, in order to sort of uh, get us back up, up to speed. So M, M1 and M2 are both um, unit vectors and they define, uh, oh, Bertie talking to the knot. I just saw some words poking behind the board. I uh, thought it might be me. Anyway, um, M1 and M2 define the face of the sundial. And we got those, uh, we, we got that, um, this frame, M1, M2, M3, through a series of rotations um, from a, an orthonormal uh, vector, um, set, you know, set of vectors, basis vectors, um, that are kind of fixed relative to the, in quotes, fixed stars, right? So alpha was our um, Earth tilt angle, right? the tilt of the Earth's axis. Um, there was um, uh, sigma um, was uh, the... Um, how far the, the center of the Earth is along its orbit around the sun. Um, psi was uh, the Earth's rotation about its axis. Theta was um, like 90 minus latitude. Um, and all of those angles uh, participated in um, uh, you know in in, uh, in creating defining the frame m1 m2 m3 which is fixed within the sundial I'm just going to put a T uh, on sigma and uh, psi there um, to note that they um, vary with time. Okay, so then um, S is a ray of sunshine. G is the gnomon, or uh, I think when it is parallel uh, to the Earth's axis, um, it's known as a style. Um, and so that's the stick that casts the shadow. Um, the shadow itself uh, is uh, is W here, and um, yeah, and we're interested in finding W, basically. Um, and you know, we have a solution for that, or at least the solution that I claimed uh, last time was uh, define a. Uh, define the plane G as the bivector, the unit bivector M1, M2. 
So that's the dial face. Define the plane S um, as S wedge G, which isn't a unit by vector anymore because S dot G uh, is not equal to one. Uh, sorry, uh, zero. Um, You know, but that is going to be um, if the angle between um, them is capital xi, uh, then that's going to be sine uh, xi away from capital S hat, which is a unit by vector. Um, we saw in the Meta Uni Festival uh, geometric algebra um, talk that I gave uh, in January um, that the that um, yeah that if uh, capital psi there is the angle between um, s and g then s wedge g squared which is a scalar. Um, is minus sine squared uh, sine. Anyway, so we've got the planes, um, big G and big S. Now, if we don't care about the length um, of this vector um, the sh of the shadow, so that, say there's a U with some arbitrary length, then, um, well, U is uh, is I G cross S where this cross is the not the vector product uh, as we're used to it's the commutator product of these two bivectors defined as just the anti-symmetric geometric product Um, and yeah, so I saw, um, yeah, so we'll get to, we'll get to that in a second. Um, but if that's true, um, then, uh, W hat, which is a normalized unit vector, um, along the shadow is U over the length of U. And if I define W of Lambda, why is, uh, why is that not u hat? Why is there a w and a and a u? Uh, you you um, no good reason. Oh, it's it's fine if that's the notation that you was in your write up. I'm, I'm fine with it. It's not. I'm complaining. I'm just making sure I didn't miss something. Uh, you aren't missing anything. Um, your your wish is my command. It's fine. It's it's you, you there's a unit vector um, along uh, that direction, um, and uh, well, I don't even know if let, let me just write, keep going and see if how where it's used. Mm -hmm. Right. So I I I can construct uh, you know W. Um, I want to go up here and down here, right? So um, G plus some scalar multiple of S mm -hmm. uh, is what I seek. Like if I know lambda, then I'm, I'm good, I'm done. Um, and so there's going to be some lambda star such that the tri-vector <coughs> um, formed with the outer product with G is the zero trivector. Mm -hmm. In other words, um, you know, the, think of a trivector just as a um, a bivector is is a plane. It's an oriented plane, so you know which way it's facing. Um, but you you and there's an area as well. Um, so you know the direction in space, um, the uh, and, and some magnitude. Think of a trivector as the same thing, but a volume, right? So it's the, you know, it's sort of think of the parallelepiped um, 
defined by three vectors. And of course, if they aren't linearly independent, um, then the volume is zero. Um, one of the vectors lies in the plane uh, defined by the other two. Uh, and we want this w uh, to lie in the g plane, in the m1, m2 plane. Um, you know, and so that's, that's it. If I can find, if I can solve this equation, uh, solve for lambda star, uh, then I put lambda star in here, and I've found um, the shadow tip. Um, Yeah, and so where I, where it went, um, where it got a bit shaky, was me claiming last time that um, the length of u, which I'm not sure I need explicitly here. Um, you know, I think you can, by solving the equation in the box, I think you can then find uh, the length of u. Um, I, I claimed that the length of u uh, was um, sine of the angle between um, s and g. And I also claimed that s dot g was cos psi. Hmm. Um, and I think I'm almost right, but not quite right uh, in that claim. So let me um, uh, try to uh, explain what I mean. And I will do so on this board. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to draw um, the plane G, uh, and the plane S, so that's G, that's S, and somewhere in G, in some arbitrary as far as this diagram is concerned, direct, uh, lo, uh, direction, pair of directions, we have m1 and m2. And similarly, in some arbitrary pair of directions here, I mean, m1 and m2 are orthogonal, um, s and g here are not, but they lie in the plane s and I want to um, use the fact that I don't, you know, I, I can um, I can use any. Uh, I don't need, need I don't need to use m1 and m2 to define the plane G. I can use any other um, ortho ortho uh, orthonormal um, vectors in that plane, um, such as uh, well, if the planes aren't parallel, there's going to be a vector, a unit vector running along their intersection here, which um, I'll call W hat, but U hat would do also. All right, and that um, that is the shadow because uh, you know, like the, if you like the physical content of this whole <laughs> problem. Um, such as it is, is that, you know, um, I'm just going to hop back to the uh, previous board, the plane containing both the sunshine vector and the gnomon, you know, that when that intersects with the uh, dial face, well, that, that is the shadow. That's kind of what we mean uh, by the shadow. So there will be, uh, you know, as long as um, uh, there isn't, I mean, 
tautology. Apologies, but <laughs> as long as the plane of the Earth is not like, uh, what, what would it take for these two to be parallel? <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I mean that can happen. Uh, you need a pretty special. I mean, isn't that um, sunset? Oh no, well not even that. Because then, like if I'm looking along the surface of the dial right. at the sun, and so the sun ray is skimming the surface, well, there's still an intersection between, like I've got my gnomon now sticking up. Mm -hmm. um, the, the shadow gets pretty long, maybe infinitely long, but um, it's still, mm -hmm. there is still this intersection. So I think it's pretty, I don't know, maybe hard to find those conditions. Anyway, I want to draw a unit vector, let's say A, and another unit vector, let's say B, such that, well, A squared, B squared, W hat squared, or one, and A dot W hat uh, is zero. And also, Uh, B dot W hat is zero. And so I can write uh, G as, well, before it was M1, M2. But as long as I keep maintain my handedness, I can equally well write that as A dot W hat, because A and W hat are orthonormal vectors in the plane G. And there is a... Wait, what? Uh, that's zero, right? I, I didn't get this last equality. What are you saying? I am I'm cringing in shame at my typo here. I meant to write that. <laughs> okay, yeah, that makes more sense. Yeah, sorry about that. Just tidying up the dots made by my hand. Okay, good. Right, so S, we, we said before, um, was S wedge G, uh, which is at least proportional to um, <clears throat> W hat wedge B in the hand handedness as drawn, which is equal to... Um, I think sign uh, of that angle. That's going to be a pain to draw, to write out all the time. So maybe I'll just define a, an S hat, which is W hat wedge B. Okay. So now, <clears throat> um, now that we've got the planes expressed in a convenient basis. Let's evaluate um, the commutator product between the two. Which if, if I just substitute the definitions in, well, okay. So now A wedge W hat is the geometric product of A and W hat uh, because the other part of the mm -hmm. geometric product uh, is up here and it vanishes. Right, so um, that is actually A W hat. And for similar reasons, S hat, it's going to be easier to do that. Looks like that. Um, and the uh, second term is that. Right, so we, we have that W hat squared is is one um, and because all of these vectors are orthogonal i introduce a minus sign when i flip that order mm. um, another minus sign when i flip that order and so these go away mm. and so this is a half of a b minus b a which is a wedge b which we know is 
is that plane containing A and B, uh, which is the plane orthogonal to um, G and S hat, hmm. and also G and S. Right, so that was the first claim from the previous board. It's that, um, you know, that the commutative product of two bivectors gives a bivector that is um, perpendicular to both. Cool. Uh, and we can also, I think, do G in the right color, G dot S, maybe hat. Um, you know, and, and actually the, the definition of the inner product of two arbitrary multivectors is the scalar part of their geometric product. So the angle brackets with a subscript denotes the subscript hmm. grade, the, the grade subscript projection. Um, and, you know, when it's a scalar projection, we just forget the zero there. And so now um, we have, um, you know, well, uh, the geometric product is A, W hat, W hat B. You know, and so that goes away, it's one. Um, and the scalar part of the geometric product of two vectors, well, um, half of it is A dot B, which is cause of that angle between the two planes. So up to the extra factor of, of that, accounting for the fact that S and G vectors are not um, particular, um, that is what I was trying to, that's what I, I claimed before and couldn't really explain in the moment. Mm. Cool, thanks. Shoal asks what the ethical implications are of this technology, Russell. No mons and their society altering implications. <laughs> should, should we have a team of ethicists available before we build sundials? <laughs> I think that's critical. <laughs> Yeah, I imagine uh, being able to inaccurately determine. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, so let's just um, sort of kick back and look at four pictures at this point. Because, I mean, if you, you know, I wrote out the solution last time, it's like a bit sort of gruesome. Um, there's a lot there, but um, it is just a machine that lets you plot um, various pictures. There is a an equation of time part um, to the story, which I think should be next. And that's the name of the next um, picture. All right. Okay. Let's hop over to it. Okay. So We all know that midday is when the sun is overhead, or at least highest in the sky, right? Only overhead if you're in the tropics um, and uh, at the, exactly the right latitude given the, well, um, okay, this is starting to encroach on the equation of time territory, actually. <laughs> uh, exactly at the right latitude. Um, you know, to see it perfectly overhead. But if it, to, to, to hit the sun, to see the sun at its highest uh, point in its trajectory through the sky, we know that that's noon, right? Thumbs up. Except it's not quite. Um, this, the black line on this graph uh, gives you the number of minutes by which it isn't exactly noon, depending on where the Earth is in its orbit around the Sun. Hmm. If the orbit around the Sun was perfectly circular, and if there was no tilt in the Earth's axis, then um, 
it would be closer to being true, right? These lines would be flat. You've still got a minor issue that um, you've, uh, by the time the Earth has spun um, 360 degrees, it's moved along its orbit, right? And so the direction, it needs to rotate like one 365th extra to actually um, get back to uh, the same direction, like your overhead direction looking precisely at the sun. Um, but ignoring that, um, if you remove the uh, elliptical, the, the, if you set the eccentricity of the elliptical orbit of the Earth around the sun to zero, in other words, the orbit becomes a circle, and if you um, remove the tilt of the Earth's uh, axis of rotation relative to the plane of the orbit, then uh, both all these curves become flat. Hmm. And each and those two effects are shown in um, uh, red and blue, respectively. Um, and you add them together to get the black. And this this is what um, gives rise to the gnomon. Uh, sorry, to the uh, anam, uh, analam. Oh God. <laughs> the analoma. Let's see how many pronunciations we can do. <laughs> the, the, yeah, the, uh, well, there's a, uh, there is. Okay, so I almost went to a certain pronunciation that might um, uh, not not been not be wise. So let's call it an analemma. Um, anyway, so the the shape of the analemma, um, you can sort of map it to this. I think right. There's a Mm. Uh, it's a figure of eight um, type shape. Um, and so one sort of oscillation up and down comes from the red, uh, and then the, the side to side, two oscillations side to side come from the blue. So let's, let's go to that. Let's look at uh, what's next. The horizontal dial figure. Cool. Okay, so this, um, like I, I did this, I was living in Cambridge um, at the time uh, when I was doing this, so I thought my first dial would be at the latitude of Cambridge, and I wanted to um, start simple, and so this is a horizontal dial, um, and for all these three plots, um, the uh, the gnomon is a style, so it's aligned um, with the Earth's um, axis of rotation. Mm -hmm. And the base of the gnomon uh, is at the origin, and there's a little circle indicating that. Um, the um, distance units are in gnomon lengths, and um, Hmm. And the uh, the summer solstice, the path of the shadow throughout the day in the summer solstice, um, is given by by this this line. Right. So that's the shortest. This is the shortest uh, that the shadow ever gets. That's at noon. Um, on the 21st of um, uh, June. Um, and similarly, the, uh, you know, the, the winter uh, solstice path is, is here. How do I interpret these collections of lines? These are different days during that season or? So then the, the lines, you mean like uh, for example, this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that is the analemma uh, corresponding to, um, well, if that's north, sun rises, so that's the afternoon. So it's 12, 1, 2, 3, that's 3 p.m. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. So the shadow goes from here to here, that point there, um, at some point during the winter. 
uh, because the blue dash part of the analemma is winter. Um, the, you know, so I guess this is, so at three o'clock, the shadow is here at the start of winter, right? And then at the winter solstice, it's up here. And just as winter, no, sorry, I'm wrong. It's here, right? Because this is, this is autumn. Okay, so there's a, I didn't get the fixed time. So we're plotting the position of the, of the, the tip of the shadow the furthest position of shadow at a fixed time during the day. No. Yep, so that's um, that's noon. This is 1 p.m. Oh, okay, I got, I got it. I got it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, cool. Right. All right, yeah. Yeah, yeah so, so this... Um, I'll switch to a different color because I've messed it up. But this... So this is, you know, just at the start of winter. Um... Every day you come back at three o'clock and you see a shadow tip, you know, here and here and here, and it and it wanders along. Mm -hmm. uh, then you hit the solstice, and then you start to move towards spring, and then spring is green, and it's down here. Um, and then uh, in the summertime, um, it's you know it, there is very little movement. It's down here, yeah. um, and you can you can not really see the full figure of eight um, going on here because it's squashed uh, in the summer. Well. But we will in a subsequent um, diagram. Mm. <laughs> cool. Yeah, so I think that's all we need to navigate the diagrams. Oh, no, there's one more. Well, I don't understand this there's horizontal the... line. Yes. This one here. Uh, no, not that one. Yes, you're absolutely right. So this horizontal line um, is the... Well, actually, there are two horizontal lines. One is green, and the other is um, grey dotted. They are both on top of each other. They <laughs> both follow this, this path. Yeah. And they are the equinox equivalents of um, this one and this one. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Right. So on the, the spring and uh, autumnal equinoxes, the shadow on that day, uh, you see the shadow um, tip follow a straight line <laughs> mm -hmm. across the battle face. Very cool. And I think that's it. I think there's, yeah, so there's quite a lot of information in, in this plot. Yeah. Um, why don't we um, go to arbitrary dial All right. next. Okay. So if you don't mind a little digression, I, I first saw the term analemma, not in a scientific text, but in uh, Neil Stevenson's book, Anathem. I don't know if you know it. It's a big chunky book about an alternative universe in which uh, mathematicians and physicists and such people are locked up in sort of monasteries to keep them from disturbing the peace um, and then at some point they're, they're needed to combat something like an alien invasion I won't spoil it by saying more than that um, and one of the main characters is kind of at their they're about to get wiped out by some attack and as a sort of statement of their deep faith in the mathematical structure of reality they they carve an analemma into the the floor beneath them as like a, a culmination of their understanding of the principles of reality or something uh, so um, i guess it's a preface to a question which is why is the analemma particularly I mean, I think it, outside of even the, that uh, that book, it sort of occupies a sort of special place in the imagination related to geometry and the heavens and so on. Why is that exactly? Why is it sort of special among all the ingredients here? Why pick it out to give it a name? Yeah, good question. I don't know the book. Uh, it sounds pretty cool. Um, perhaps I should check it out. Um, 
or maybe that's a retirement project. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a bit long, um, but I think you can handle it before you retire. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, actually, I do have, I employ the um, audio book while driving kids mm. to places. Mm -hmm. back. Well, not, well, on the way back, basically. Um, that's my, anyway, uh, we digress, don't we? Um, I don't really know. Uh, I, I think it is kind of fundamental in that it's orthogonal, in a sense, to um, the four lines uh, that we discussed, right? The um, the solstice shadow path during the day, um, summer solstice, the winter solstice, uh, and then the equinoxes, right? You um, you 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 fix the day and you let the time in the day vary and you get those lines and so they're sort of easiest to to observe mm. but if you transpose that and you fix the time of day and then let the day vary over the year well then you see that other shape mm. um and it's a kind of a cool shape because it's a figure of eight and so why yeah um, yeah it's so simple and yet there's enough complexity in there to really trigger the mind into inquiring you know what's going on i think so yeah that sounds that's right it. yeah maybe it's maybe it's as you say partly because it's not it's not trivial to observe it you have to keep some records and then you infer it and then you're like oh my god there's a very interesting structure here yeah hmm. exactly you can photograph it right there are pictures on on the internet of um someone if you put a camera facing up uh, and then at the same time every day take a picture mm, mm. and then super impose uh, superpose all the pictures then you get an analema drawn by the sun mm. which is also kind of nice so um i went a bit um you know arbitrary here we are 10 degrees south of the equator the uh, dial face is inclined by 50, 15 degrees and declined by 20 degrees. The gnomon is at an inclination of 20 degrees here, um, but it is in the meridian plane, so no, um, no declination. <laughs> well, we can see the analemmas here better. Yeah, exactly. So you're seeing some really nice, um, you know, like that one is mm. a very clear uh, figure of eight. <laughs> yeah. And then as a final um, kind of uh, check, I suppose, of these results against intuition, we could look at uh, an Arctic sundial. Coming up. I mean, I, I wonder whether there is such a thing in real life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe nobody's ever put a sundial in the Arctic. Well, there's a re there's a real retirement project for you, Russell. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> That's oh, right. Oh wow. That's really interesting. You know, so, um, so winter was the blue um, dashed line, right? And clearly, there's no. Um, there's no, there's no winter. I mean, sorry, there's no winter in the Arctic. Uh, that's not quite right, but you know what I mean. There's, there's no, um, your, your, there's no sun uh, to, um, you know, operate the dial um, in the, uh, in the winter. Uh, and you can see how, um, you know. So there is the. Uh, um, I don't know, fulcrum, the center point of the figure of eight, an alama, um, you know, and it, come, it loops in here and comes back out and then shoots off to very far away. Interestingly, you know, still in the equinoxes, you get this straight line, um, uh, uh, both in the spring and the autumn equinox, uh, the same straight, straight line, uh, just at some sort of arbitrary uh direction what do i have i'm at 80 degrees north latitude i've declined the um sundial by 30 degrees um 
Oh, and the gnomon, I, I wrote in, my, in the caption on this figure in the paper, the gnomon here is a true gnomon being vertical with zero inclination. And I forgot that. I think I read somewhere um, that, yeah, that for a gnomon to be a real one, it's got to be sticking straight up. Hmm. And so clearly you can get very long uh, shadows. <laughs> Um, so the analemas uh, shoot off very far away. Um, and the summer solstice uh, shadow tip travels in, in a nice um, loop, ellipse, maybe. I don't know, actually, what the precise shape is. Yeah, that's interesting. Trying to figure out whether analemmas are actually algebraic curves. Like are they defined by polynomials? Maybe. I mean the equations you gave are kind of analytic, right? They involve trigonometric functions, but do you know if there's a, yeah. a polynomial equation whose solution is the analemma? Seems like they're related to seems probably they are yeah, I don't know. My intuition also leans in that direction. Mm -hmm. I mean, I um, like I've got the, you know the polar coordinates are the most readily available in the analysis I went through, uh, but it's trivial to um, you know form Cartesian coordinates. Of course, you just dot. The you dot w into m one and m two. Mm. Yeah, it's a good question. I, I actually didn't really appreciate the significance and implications of um, algebraic curves twenty years ago when I was doing this. It's only. Um, exposure to you guys, to you, you, you people. Mm. Yeah, it's a fun question for some other time. Indeed. So, that's that's it, I think. Awesome. This was this was a blast. Thanks, Russell. I'm really glad. Well, first of all, that you wrote this ages ago and that you. Uh, took the time to present it. I enjoyed this a lot. Uh, you're very welcome. It was nice to dig it all out mm. again. You can see why it had such an impact on on people, this kind of thing, uh, back when it was, well, of course, some of this is, is very recent or, or new entirely, but the sort of basic, the basic program of trying to figure out the explanation for this strange regular geometry in the heavens um, yeah, it doesn't, doesn't lose its appeal thousands of years later. Absolutely. I mean, I can't help but think of the birth of modern science, you know, with Galileo and Copernicus and all that. And sundials, a knowledge of them predated um, them by so much time, you know, centuries and centuries. But I suppose you don't need, you know, you can be you can um, sort of algorithmically like use the observed kind of geometry to do something useful without really having a, having an explanation mm. um, or, or with multiple different, you know, you can have a bad explanation like a, um, you know, geocentric um, view of the universe uh, and still um, kind of do sundials and use sundials. So maybe it's not that crazy, but it's not that crazy that you know my thought was how could it take so long to challenge you know the um kind of prevailing uh, model of the universe <laughs> given the evidence by sundials mm -hmm. um, so i should have explained that that's what i was sort of uh riffing on um out loud just then and, and so but anyway and i guess my answer would be that you know, there's a difference between um, 
like I, I guess it's sort of instrumentalism versus uh, explanation. Right? You can you can use a a theory, a sundial. You can use the geometry and the mathematics to do something useful and make predictions even without um, having a really good explanation um, for how it arises. Hmm. Maybe it's also a good advertisement for the purposeless pursuit of strange phenomena, right? I mean, you see the analemma, what, what good could it possibly do to get to the bottom of that? It's certainly irrelevant to all practical concerns. Uh, but you dig and you dig and you dig. And uh, yeah, then one day maybe you have calculus. <laughs> right. Yes. All right. Um, yeah, thanks a lot, Russell. Any questions, Chad? Any closing thoughts on this sequence? Thumbs up. Very good. Thumbs up. All right. All right, cool. Thank you.